uh, the 360 does memory encryption, but none, none of the other consoles do, and it also does memory hashing. So you can't tap a memory bus or glitch something and be protected areas of memory. You can't DMA to them. It basically prevents a whole bunch of hardware-based and the DMA-based DM, uh, memory attacks. And uh, the 360 and the PS3 have a hypervisor, which uh, serve, uh, helps supervise uh, other application code running on them and uh, put, does some of the security stuff in the hypervisor. The PS3, however, also has user mode and kernel mode. So the PS3 has all three levels, user, kernel, and hypervisor mode, while the 360 only has kernel and hypervisor mode. It does not do um, user mode. It runs all games in kernel mode. And the Wii runs everything in kernel mode. It doesn't even try to separate stuff on the uh, main CPU. Uh, and uh, the 360 has uh, e-fuses, which are used to prevent downgrades. It actually blows a fuse inside the CPU when uh, you update, uh, when you perform some system updates, and you can't reverse that anyway, so once you run an update, there's no way you can downgrade unless you can break the chain of trust before that check happens, which, uh, as far as I know, has not happened so far. So, uh, these are the features of uh, the consoles. There's one, however, on the PS3 that's already kind of useless, because uh, it's, it turns out the PS3 encrypts stuff with a key that's uh, the same for every sector and the same IV, and doesn't hash anything. So, they pulled off this neat trick where you can copy a file into your PS3, like a movie or something, then you can find those sectors by watching what changed on the drive, then you take so another chunk of the drive, copy it on top, then read the movie back, and it decrypts those sectors that you copied on top for you. So you can do that to decrypt any chunk of the hard drive, and since they don't verify anything, and everything uses the same key and the same IV, it just works. So that encrypted storage is pretty much screwed up to begin with. Okay, so the PS3, however, have other OS, uh, which is a way to run Linux. And uh, as, you, uh, as we saw, well, it's, I'm pretty sure it worked as a deterrent because people could already run code, so why break it? But then Sony decided to uh, get rid of it on the PS3 Slim, which is, you know, it's a, it's a way of drawing attention. So, yeah. <laughs> Because now people are going to start looking at your system, and we know now that there's no technical reason not to have Linux on the PS3 Slim. So it was either marketing or some kind of you know boss somewhere said we don't want Linux, or we don't want people running their own code, or we don't know why. But they definitely drew people's attention with this, and now people started trying to hack into the PS3, and uh, GeoHot tried to give it a shot. So uh, you may know that uh, on the Wii, our first exploit was the tweezer attack, which worked by shorting out some RAM address lines and glitching the RAM bus to access areas of memory that we were not supposed to access. Juhat did something like that on the PS3. He glitched the RAM bus to essentially access areas that you're not supposed to access. So the way this works usually is uh, you have a hypervisor and you have a kernel the, on the same chunk of memory, but the hypervisor controls the mage tables to control uh, memory access permissions for the kernel. So when you allocate some memory from the kernel, the hypervisor gives you a mapping to that memory so that you can access it. And when you uh, remove that uh, chunk of memory, it deletes that mapping and you cannot access it anymore. Uh, GeoHot glitched the memory bus right when that write happened so that even though the hypervisor thinks you have that chunk of memory allocated, in reality, it's not actually, um, it's not freed completely because the kernel has still a, uh, a page entry that can access it. So the hypervisor thinks that's free memory, but you can still read and write from it, which is bad. And uh, finally, all you have to do is ask the hypervisor to create a new virtual uh, address space, which means create a new page table. And if you're lucky, it ends up in that chunk of RAM. And then suddenly you have access to the page table. You can read and write from it. If you can write to the page table, you can map the hypervisor. If you can map the hypervisor, you can do anything you want in hypervisor mode. Uh, so that gets us hypervisor exposure. So this was kind of an academic hack. Uh, it worked, and you could do stuff in hypervisor mode, but it required really annoying hardware to pull off. It was really unreliable. And even when you got hypervisor dumps, no one really knew what to do with them. They were kind of there, and eh, whatever. Sony, for some reason, got really, really, you know, really annoyed at this because they decided to piss a lot of people off by removing other OS completely from old PS3s. I'm pretty sure that violated some uh, European consumer protection laws and stuff. So, but the worst part of, it is, is, of this is that the people who use other OS are the hackers. So by doing this, Sony pissed off the hackers. <laughs> That's a really, really bad idea.
Well, in other words, they are still getting hacked now. So for a while, interestingly, nothing really happened. Uh, and uh, obviously, someone was working on this behind the scenes, because then we got the PS jailbreak, and then we got a whole ton of clones of it. So the PS jailbreak is a device that lets you run your own code at LV2 kernel level and above, and it uses a clever USB exploit to do that. Uh, it's actually a USB device that pretends to be multiple USB devices behind a hub. Uh, we'll ignore most of those for now, because uh, we've got to keep this short. But the important ones are the first one and the fourth uh, uh, owner's device, as we call them. The first one just delivers a payload as part of a USB information uh, descriptor into the, um, the hyper, I mean, the uh, LV2, I mean, yeah, the LV2 kernel. Uh, its sole purpose is to put this payload into memory. It doesn't really do anything once it's there. And then device number four uh, gets loaded, and here's where uh, the magic happens. There's some stuff that happened before that, but so device number four has, uh, number four has several configuration descriptors. The first one is loaded from the device, and that works out fine. It gets put into this blue buffer. And then the second descriptor gets loaded, but something weird happens. The PS jailbreak um, does an interesting glitch with USB. When you read a descriptor, it has a total length. But to read the descriptor, you need the length. So it's a chicken and egg problem. USB solves this by reading the first eight or so bytes uh, to begin with. Then you read the length from that. Then you read the whole descriptor again once you know the actual length and you can request all the data. So the PS jailbreak returns uh, a normal descriptor uh, length the first time around when it reads the first eight bytes. Then the second time around, it actually returns zero. That forces the USB uh, code to glitch and never actually copy the descriptor out because now it thinks it's length zero, even though it read it. So the funny thing is, well, um, LV2 is going to try to parse that descriptor that's not actually there. So it's uninitialized memory. What's actually there is it turns out that device number two was plugged in before and then unplugged, and it sort of uh, initialized that memory for LV2. And it has these four uh, funny bytes at the bottom, uh, 04, uh, 2.1, B4, 2F. When you parse that as a configuration descriptor, which is what it's going to try to do, it thinks it's a descriptor with length 2FB4, which is really, really long. It's past the buffer. So we've overflowed this buffer, and it, now it tries to load configuration number three, and it jumps 2FB4 bytes forward, out the buffer, and into a C++ object array that actually belongs to device number three. Uh, yeah, three. So it puts this configuration descriptor right on top of C++ objects, and it overwrites the V table of C++ objects to point to the payload. This V table holds function pointers for things like the destructors and some virtual methods and things like that. So when these objects get destroyed, um, they actually run our own code. So when device number three, which has a bunch of crap that created these objects, gets unplugged, we gain LB2 code execution. So this was implemented by the PS jailbreak and then cloned, and you know, there are a whole bunch of implementations of it. Um, the funny thing is, OK, so this works. Why does it work? Uh, why can't we just run code from data memory? This is a solved problem, right? Well, it turns out that LV2 does not do writes or execute on its kernel. It does not try to protect uh, executable, uh, I mean, data from being executed, which is kind of silly, because you know, we've had this for a while now. But even more importantly, the hypervisor doesn't know anything about this because the hypervisor will happily map any memory you want as executable. Unlike on the 360 where the hypervisor actually verifies anything mapped as, as executable, so it can, it can guarantee that any code running has been signed, on the PS3, the hypervisor doesn't even try to do that. It's a hypervisor meant for virtualizing operating systems, not for security. So it's the wrong kind of hypervisor. It really doesn't do what you want it to do for a security system. It just kind of sits there and looks nice and doesn't protect you from these kinds of bugs. So OK, so we have LV2 compromised. We have not compromised the hypervisor, and we have not compromised uh, the secure SPE. So all those are fine. So what happens now? Well, so why on earth can we pirate games by just compromising LV2? Well, it's because the security system makes no sense. So it turns out that you can just copy games to the hard drive patch LV2 to run them for the hard drive, and LV1 doesn't care, and the security SP doesn't care. So you can break 20% of the security and copy games, which is 100% of what Sony doesn't want you to do. <laughs> <laughs> so
So let's go back to our overview of the security features. Uh, obviously, the hypervisor is basically useless because it doesn't prevent you from copying games. So what on earth is it doing? Uh, and it's not uh, preventing you from running your own code either because you can just use an exploit. And uh, the signed executables are also pretty useless because the hypervisor does not enforce them uh, to be signed, to be loaded into memory. You can just ask it for some executable pages. And it just does that. OK, so Sony fixed this, obviously. And uh, when Sony fixed, uh, fixes something, as you might know from the PSP3 uh, scene, everyone thinks, OK, let's downgrade. So uh, people started uh, looking into this. And uh, I th believe it was the people behind the PS jailbreak who also came up with a way of downgrading. And the way that this works is that Sony has a service mode that they use in, um, in their service centers that puts the PS3 into a special mode where it can run some signed code from a USB stick. This service mode is entered by using a USB dongle that uh, does some crypto auth with the PS3. But it turns out it's a symmetric auth. It's, a it's uh, HMAC. And uh, since people had broken into the PS3, they found the keys, dumped them, and made their own clone jigs, which is what they call them. And uh, there was a service app that was signed, that was leaked, that lets you uh, reinstall the operating system on a PS3 without any kind of downgrade check. So you just use this jig, then put this on a USB stick, put a upgrade or well, a, a system install file on a USB drive, and it just installs that without checking if it's older or newer or anything like that. And since people can downgrade, back to piracy. OK, so what we did with uh, this whole PSG rig thing is uh, we wrote Asbestos, which is a replacement for game OS. The idea, I mean, sorry, for other OS. The idea is that, well, since game OS and other OS really are kind of the same thing with different permissions, the hypervisor interface is the same, you can basically replace level two with Linux. So uh, Asbestos takes over uh, level two. And uh, then uh, you can pretty much just uh, run, run a Linux kernel, bootload it from a network or something like that. And you can, you can run Linux again, even on a PS3 Slim. It turned out it just worked. There's nothing about the Slim that makes Linux not work. So it was all, you know, the, the reason why it doesn't uh, support it is because they didn't want to support it. And uh, we also added a feature to it that lets you make your PS3 into a dumb slave that you can control from your PC. And you can use this to experiment with Python scripts, uh, poking the hypervisor, poking the SPEs, reading, writing memory, making hypercalls. Basically, it's a way to experiment with PS3 and especially its security system really, really quickly from a PC environment. OK. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so what have we done so far? So far, we managed to break into level two with, with some um, jig where we have to plug, some, plug something into the U USB bus, then turn it on, press eject, and then it actually runs your code. But um, we want more than that. We want like some vulnerabil vulnerability where we can just turn the PS2, uh, PS3 on and just boot into Linux for us. So to do that, we need to figure out some more stuff, like how does Sony encrypt their elves? So what they do is they take, they build a normal elf, uh, elf using uh, just some compiler and stick a header on top of that. So this is their crypto header marked in blue and green here. And they have each of those loaders running on the isolated SP SPUs has some loader key, which can be used to decrypt a unique self key. This one is then used to decrypt the rest of the header. And at this point, the signature is checked. So the signature we're going to talk about that later is essentially um, all, the blue all the stuff marked in blue there is signed. So you can't modify any anything in there. And then the header also has a table of AES keys and SHA-1 hashes so that they can actually encrypt the program headers and make sure that you don't modify them. So as soon as you modify a, somewhere, a bit somewhere in the whole self, it will not work anymore because either some hash is not, uh, doesn't verify anymore or because the signature itself, um, well, is wrong. So, so yeah, those are the, like every code Sony gives you is wrapped into those files so you can't see anything. 